Welcome to the course on design and analysis of algorithms. Our topic today is dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is a powerful technique for designing algorithms and it actually finds applications in many, many areas. The name itself is not really very, very enlightening, so I will not talk about it. There is an origin, the, the origin is somewhat obscure and so let us not worry about it. But as I said, the technique finds applications in many areas including operations research, signal processing, computational biology, geometry and many more. We are going to view dynamic programming as a uh, technique for combinatorial optimization and in some sense we will think of dynamic programming as an optimization of the backtrack search technique that we have seen so far. So, we will think of dynamic programming as in some sense an optimization of backtrack search. So, here is what I am going to do today. I am going to talk about, I am going to take an example to illustrate this technique and this example is going to be our familiar knapsack problem. So, I am going to review the backtrack search solution. Then I am going to see, I am going to say how we can really view it slightly differently and how we can optimize it and that is how we will lead into the dynamic programming idea. And then I will describe some details and then I will summarize. So, let me take an example of an knapsack problem. Okay. So, let us say our knapsack problem, okay, let me remind you that our knapsack problem involves filling a knapsack with objects of the maximum value. The input to this problem are two vectors. Let us say v, v is one of the vectors which gives the value of each object. So, let us say we have v values which are 7, 2, 1, 6 and 12. This just means that the first object has value 7, the second object has value 2, the third object has value 1, the fourth object has value 6 and so on. So, you can think of the value as being given to us in rupees or something like that. Then we are also given another vector. So, this vector gives us the weight of each object. So, for example, we might have that the first object weighs 3 kilograms, the second object weighs 1 kilogram, the third object weighs 2 kilograms, the fourth object weighs 4 kilograms and say the last object weighs 6 kilograms. And finally, we are given a knapsack and its capacity. So, this is our last parameter c and say this time c is given to be 10. So, let me remind you what the problem is. We are supposed to pick up objects from this set such that the total weight is at most 10, but we want to pick up the objects of maximum value. So, this is the problem. Let me now remind you how we did backtrack search on this. So, we began the backtrack search by saying that at present we have all possible objects in front of us and we have not picked up any object. So, that corresponds to the first node in our search. So, let me draw that node out here. Okay. So, so, this first brace says that we have not really made any decision yet on, on any object. We have not picked up any objects yet and the second set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 
gives us the list or this is the set of objects which I, which I still need to make a decision about. So, this first vertex just says that I have to make a decision about all objects and backtrack search systemat systematically goes through the entire search space and determines the, the, the value when different objects are, are picked or not picked. The first decision point is where we decide whether or not to first uh, whether or not to pick up the first object. So, on this side I am going to consider the case that the first object in fact is not picked. So, for example, I will write here nothing has been picked yet, but to indicate the fact that I have made a decision about the first object, I will remove the first object from the list of from the set of objects which about which I have to make a decision. So, I will just write 2, 3, 4, 5 over here. On this side, I will make the other choice which is I will pick up 1 and then on this side I will include 2, 3, 4, 5. This means that I have decided to pick up the first object and these are the objects about which I yet have to make a decision. In a similar manner, I will keep on examining each of these nodes, I will make more and more decisions and I will systematically evaluate all the possibilities. So, for example, on this side, I could have said that, okay, so next decision is about object 2, so maybe I will, on this side I will not pick up object 2, on this side maybe I will pick up object 2. Okay. So, now the set of object that remains picked, uh, unpicked is uh, 3, 4, 5 or the set of object which remains undecided is 3, 4, 5. On this side, similarly let us say I go to the left and as I said we have by convention decided that on the left side I will not be picking up, picking up the corresponding objects. So, again the objects that I have selected are only one whereas, I have just made a decision about object 2 and I said I am not going to pick it up. So, the objects that are remaining are 3, 4 and 5 okay? and so on. I will explore the tree in this manner and we remarked long ago that if we do this, we will generate a tree with height with total number of leaves 2 to the n if n denotes the number of objects. That clearly is too large a time for even for moderately large n and so we clearly need a better algorithm than this. Now, I am going to take a different view of this backtrack search procedure that I just described. Okay. Okay, let me first remind you what the backtrack search view is. So, the backtrack search view of a vertex in this tree corresponds to a partially constructed solution. So, for example, I wrote 2 and 3, 4, 5. This just says that I have included 2 in my solution. I have decided not to include object 1 and this is the part about which I have not yet made any decisions. But here is an alternate view. Suppose I have decided to include 2. So, let me go back to my old problem. So, if I decide to include 2 and not 1 and I have a capacity 10, then that means that out of the capacity that I had of 10, I have used up capacity equal to 1 because the second object has weight 1. So, that means corresponding to this vertex, so this, this choice of mine really says that our new capacity after I have decided to include object 2 is 10 minus weight of the second object. In this case 10 minus the weight of second object happens to be 1 and therefore the new capacity happens to be 9. And then I have not yet made decisions about objects 3, 4, 5. Okay? So, rather than thinking about this 
this remaining part as an extension of the old solution, this new view encourages us to think that let us forget our original capacity. Let us say, let us deal with what really is remaining. What really is remaining is 9. So, we have capacity of 9 which is remaining and we have to fill it with 3, 4, 5, one of, with these objects 3, 4, 5. Okay, so, we, we are allowed now to take objects from this set 3, 4, 5. Our, capac our capacity is 9, that means the weight of objects which we select from this must not go beyond 9 and within that we want to maximize our value. Clearly, solving this problem, extending the solution over here is exactly the same as this, as extending the solution, as, as, as solving this independent problem. That is because even here, I will have used up one unit of capacity okay, uh, out of the 10 units that I already had. And clearly, it makes sense for me to fill up the remaining capacity with the best, the most valuable objects from this set whose total weight is less than 9. And that is exactly what happens here as well. So, this is however, a substantial improvement because now our view is that we are not really thinking about extending a solution, but we are thinking of solving an independent problem and further that problem is of the same kind as the original problem. So, rather than saying that let us extend a solution, we will just say that look in order to solve this original problem, let us solve this alternate problem. Okay. But this problem is not an extension of any, any extension of any solution, but it is a simple new problem of the same kind. So, this first of all introduces a simplification in our outlook okay. and in some sense it makes programming easier. So, the benefits of this new view. The first benefit is that this new view is simpler or I would state that as the outlook, our outlook overall is simpler. This in turn suggests that our programming is going to be easier. I will talk more about this in a minute and you will see that indeed the programming gets simplified. However, these two are not really the main important benefits. There is an additional benefit which is much more important, but about which I am not going to tell you right now. Let us wait until I tell you how to do the programming and then I will tell you about this surprise benefit and you will agree with me then that this is really a very exciting benefit. So, let us start, let us worry about how are we going to program this. So, the idea was that in order to solve the knapsack problem, instead of thinking about extending the solution, we said let us construct a new problem of the same kind and then solve that, maybe one or as you will see, maybe more problems of the same kind and solve that. So, this naturally means that we should be thinking of recursion. So, let me write down a recursive procedure to solve this knapsack problem. So, let me first define that procedure, let me write down the specifications of that procedure first. So, I will call my procedure K s and it will take two parameters. C and I. Okay. C is going to be the capacity remaining or actually I should say rather than remaining that the capacity given for solving the problem. So, let me just strike this off. 
capacity for containing solution. I is a parameter which is the index of the first unde undecided object. Or in, in fact, instead of thinking about the first, thinking of it as the first undecided object, I could think of it as the first object which is allowed. So, the objects which are allowed for me are i, i plus 1, i plus 2, all the way till n. So, my original problem that I needed to solve was say something like k s of 10 comma 1. What does this indicate? That I want to solve the knapsack problem on a knapsack of capacity 10 and I want all the objects from the first object onward until n to be considered. I have not told you what n is and let us assume that n is a global variable. So, there are some global variables over here. Okay. So, n is a global variable, the total number of objects. Similarly, the value array is a global variable and the weight array is also a global variable. And let me just remind you that there are n components in each of these arrays. So, these are the specifications of the procedure that I am going to write. So, let me now write the procedure. So, let us get, let us deal with the base case first. So, that is fairly easy. K s of C i. Okay, so, first the base case. So, if i is greater than n. Okay. So, that means that I am being asked to solve a problem starting from the n plus first object or some object beyond n. That means, I really have made up my mind about all the previous objects in some sense or in essentially what I am saying is that I am not allowed to choose any objects at all. In that case, we should be returning 0 as the value of the solution. I should say before I get into this that in this problem that in this specification that I wrote down, I should also say that we will only be worried about the value of the optimal solution. So, the idea is that case of 10 comma 1 will not actually return the set of objects which are chosen, but in fact it will return the best possible value that I can get out of it. Now, you might think that this is a bit of a simplification of the problem that is given to us and in some sense it is, but later on you will see that in fact once we know what the value is, it is very easy to go back over our calculations and actually figure out what that set was. So, we will leave that for the future or for later in the later in this lecture. Right now, we will just concentrate on determining what is the maximum value I can get by filling my knapsack so that it does not overflow, it, do, it is not overloaded. This is the base case if i has already gone past n, then that means we have considered all the possible objects and then we should be returning 0, because there is, there is nothing to add to our knapsack. Okay. So, we have already returned. Okay. Otherwise, the first object that we are going to be considering is the ith object. So, what can we do about it? Well, we need to consider it only if the capacity is in fact able to take that object. So, if c, if the capacity happens to be less than the weight of the object, then we cannot do anything. right? So, if, if the capacity happens to be is less than the weight of the object, then that object cannot be considered, which means we should just go on 
to the next object and return whatever we can with the next with the remaining objects. So, in that case we are going to return k s of c and i plus 1. The interesting case appears if c is in fact bigger than w of i. So, else what happens? So, else we have the possibility that we can in fact include this object in our knapsack. Of course, it might not always be wise to include that object simply because if we include that object we have to reduce, we have to use up some of our capacity and maybe the benefit that we get because of using up that capacity is not adequate enough or because we might be losing some better options later on. So, therefore, to cover both possibilities here is what we should do. We should return the best of those two worlds. Okay. So, the first is we will ignore this current object in which case we should be returning k s of c comma i plus 1 okay. and then we need to consider the other possibility which is that we include this i plus four, this ith object, but if we do include the ith object there are two effects. First of all we get its value, so we should be returning in whatever we return we should include that value as well. So, we are going to return v of i, but we will also get some value from the remaining objects. However, when we go for the remaining objects we would not have the full capacity c to consider, but instead we will have a capacity which is a little bit reduced. So, we should so we should be returning v i plus k s of c minus weight of i because this is the amount by which the capacity is going to be reduced and whatever choice we can make from the i plus 1 from the remaining objects. So, this is what we should return the best of this quantity and this quantity. So, this finishes a recursive implementation of that backtrack search that I just mentioned. Just to make sure that, that, the, that we understand this let us actually execute this on a sample on our own example in fact. So, let me write down what our v s and w s are. So, our v s and w s were v was 7 2 1 6 12 w was 3 1 2 4 6 and our capacity was 10. We started off by making the first call which was k s of 10 comma 1, k s of 10 comma 1. Okay. Now, let us go back to our code and, and our value of n was equal to 5. So, if we go back to our code and ask how this code would execute, the first step we have to check is, is i bigger than n n is 5 and i is 1. So, clearly this does not happen and so we come to this situation. So, the weight of the first object is 3 and the capacity is certainly bigger than that. Okay. So, this is not the case that we execute, but instead we execute this case. In that case we are going to consider two possibilities. One is searching, uh, uh, searching the knapsack possibilities with the same capacity and i plus 1. So, let me draw this as a recursion tree. So, here I am going to get k s of 10 comma 2 and on this side I am going to get whatever is whatever corresponds to this, but what corresponds to this? We are going to use up out of the c capacity we are going to use up w i capacity. So, w of 1 capacity is going to get used up that w of 1 capacity is 3 units. So, on this side I am to get I am going to make a call k s with the remaining capacity which is 7 comma 2 because now I am going to only consider objects starting at the second object. 
In this manner, we are going to execute. So, let me do a few executions just to make sure that the idea is understood. What happens when we try case of 10, 2? Again, even here you will see that the weight of the second object is 1 and that is still large, that is still smaller than the capacity and therefore, we will use this, uh, this part of the if statement. So, the first thing we will execute is case of c comma i plus 1 which is with the same capacity we will try to go for the remaining objects. So, we will be executing case of 10 comma 3 and on this side we will be executing a recursive call corresponding to this call over here. W of 2 now is this. So, we will have to decrement that 1 from that and therefore, the call that we execute over here will be case of 9 comma 3. Let us do one more of these calls. So, let us see what happens when case of 9 comma 3 is executed further. So, again if you go back to this procedure you will see that even here the capacity is larger than this w i w of 3, w of 3 is 2 and it is still larger and therefore, this will get executed. So, again there will be two children, two recursive calls. So, the first one will simply be k s of 9 comma 4 and on this side the call would be k s of c minus w i. So, c minus w i this time is this. So, it is going to be 7 comma 3 sorry 7 comma 4. Let us do something on this side and so, so what happens over here. So, case of 7 comma 2 if we execute we are going to get something like this. So, first we will execute k s of 7 comma 3. This corresponds to the possibility that we do not choose the third object. There will of course, be a corresponding exploration on this side where we do choose the third object, but even here there will be two possibilities k s of 7 comma 4 and on this side the possibility that we choose the third object. So, whatever that is. At this point, I would like you to do two things. First of all, I would like to make sure that this picture is understood. What we have drawn in this picture is what is popularly called a recursion tree. So, this is the first recursive call we made. That call gave rise to this recursive call and this recursive call. That in turn gave rise to these two recursive calls. This will give rise to this call and some other call over here and so on. But that is of course, quite routine the most interesting part of this picture are these two calls. Okay. I should really write this as k s. So, there is something very interesting about these two calls. They are identical. What does it mean? In this part of the tree, I am going to make a procedure call with parameters 7 and 4 and I am also going to make a procedure call on this side also with parameters 7 and 4. So, this is the beauty. So, th th so there, this is where the optimization can come in. Once I explore this search tree underneath this, I do not need to understand, I, I do not need to explore this search tree again. If I store the value that I get from this call, then when I come to this portion, if I, I just need to look it up, I will just look it up and I will get it. In fact, that is going to be my default idea. Whenever I calculate the value of a certain recursive call, I will actually store it in a table. Before embarking on any recursive call, I will first check if the table already contains that value. If it does, I will just use that value. If it does not, then I will calculate that value, but at the end of it, I will store it in the table. That is basically the idea. That is basically the optimization that I was talking about. And you can see that by viewing what remains to be done rather than thinking of this search tree as an exploration in which you are extending solutions, it is 
in, in this view of in this new view of things it is possible to determine that the work over here is the same as the work over here and thereby we can do this optimization that we that I just mentioned. So, let me, let me now flesh out this optimization for you. So, we will go back to the same code and now I will write down what are the what is the corresponding code uh, with the optimization. So, let me write that down in a different color. So, if i greater than n then return, z, uh, return 0 is the idea over here. Okay. So, we said that before returning any value we are going to store it in some table. So, instead of that instead of just returning 0 this part of the code will be replaced by this part. So, we are going to still check if i is greater than n. But if it is, then we are going to we are going to say set table of c comma i equal to zero, and then we are going to return table of c comma i. Okay. So this is what this statement is going to be replaced by in our optimized version. Let me just remind you that, that the idea is to remember values before we calculate them. So, we are going to have another global array called table and table is going to have this is going to be a two dimensional array. So, we are going to have the first index correspond to all possible capacities and the second index correspond to all the i's okay, all the possible values of i. So, this is going to be uh, i is going to be from 1 to well n and as we saw our sentinel uh, our base case actually takes it beyond n. So, it is going to be n plus 1. So, the second dimension is going to be n plus 1 c is going to be in the range 0 through whatever value okay so uh, the the capacity given okay so in fact let's say this is little c and so little c 0 is less than or equal to little c less than or equal to capital c so the second uh, the the first index or the first dimension will have this range okay so this is a two dimensional array in which we are going to store our values what about this? If c is less than w i return case of c i plus 1. Well, we just defined a rule and we are just going to follow it. So, instead of returning case of c i plus 1, we are going to first check. So, the way we check, I will just write down the code corresponding to this. So, we are going to check if table of c comma i plus 1 is not calculated and that I will denote by null. Okay. Then we are going to actually calculate it. So, we will calculate table of c comma i plus 1 is equal to k s of c comma i plus 1 and then we will return table of c comma i plus 1. So, this is going to be what this code is will replace this code over here. Similarly, we will have code which will replace this as well. Okay. So, corresponding to this we will just make a check in c i plus 1 here. So, this part will really be the same as this and instead of this we will make a check in a slightly different position. Okay. So, uh, okay, so, let me write that down as well. Okay. So, let me write that down separately over here. So, return max of c i plus 1 is going to be done by first checking whether case of c i plus 1 has been calculated. So, that is as good as saying if table of okay. So, return this expression is going to be done by checking this. 
So, we are going to check if table of uh, C i plus 1 is equal to null. So, in that case we are going to calculate it. So, we are going to set table of C i plus 1 equal to k s uh, of C i plus 1. Okay. Then we are going to check whether this has been calculated as well. So, that is as good as saying if table if table of C minus w i i plus 1 is equal to null, okay. then we actually calculate it table of C minus w i i plus 1 is equal to k s <coughs> of C i plus 1. Okay. And then finally, we will just return the maximum of these two quantities <coughs> and that is done simply by saying return max of table of <coughs> c comma i plus 1 and v of i plus table of c minus w i comma i plus 1. So, this code will replace this last code in our program. So, it should be clear to you that this new code that we have written in fact is going to do less work because some parts of the search tree which were explored several times in the original code will now be explored exactly once. But now we would like to prove by how much precisely the work gets reduced. So, we come to the analysis. Normally, when you write recursive algorithms, <coughs> the idea is that we will write a recurrence to solve uh, recurrence for the time taken and we will solve that recurrence. In the case of dynamic programming and in particular where we store these values in a table and use them as needed, this recursive estimate is not going to be very good, it is going to be an overestimate. So, we need something much more precise. Okay, we can, we can, we can produce an estimate, we can produce a way of doing that estimate which gives us much sharper bounds. So, here is the idea. So, think of it this way as the computer executes each line of the code, suppose it writes a diary. In the diary, it is going to write the following things. Okay. So, I am going to call this diary, it is customary to call this diary a transcript. Okay, so, this is going to be a transcript of the execution. So, the computer is going to write down the line number in the program then it is going to write down the value of c that is cur that currently it has and then the value of i that it currently it has. It is going to write down a triple like this. So, it will write down one such triple every time it executes a line in the program. Why are we doing this? This will become clear in just a minute. But the idea is clear. So, let me take an example. So, here is my code. So, let us say we have numbered the lines in this code. So, I am going to for simplicity I am going to think of this as being my code or actually I could do this as well. So, this is my this is line number 1, okay. this is line number 2, this is line number 3 and so on. So, I give numbers to every line in this program and I have added some lines over here. So, I will give numbers to these lines as well. Maybe this is line number 14, this is line number 15, this is line number 16 and so on. So, I have, I have given numbers to everything whatever this is line number 20. Okay. So, when the program starts executing, I am going to be making the call k s of c i. So, what will the computer write the first time around? 
So this is going to be my line number 1, whatever, this is going to be my line number 1, this is going to be line number 2 and so on. So my transcript of my program is going to be the line number which is 1. What will the value of c be? The first time the value of c is 10 and the value of i is 1. So this will be the first entry in my transcript. The next entry in my transcript is I am going to execute the next line of the program 2, 10 and 1. As I keep writing at some points things will change. Okay, of course, the line number will change almost every time, but at some points this 10 will also change. The 10 will change according to my execution tree which I had drawn over here. So, this, so in this execution tree I started off with ks 10 1, but then I went on to ks 10 2. So, at some point during this execution, I am going to get again 1, 10, 2. So, this corresponds to the second, the, the first recursive call. And similarly, the different recursive calls will come out over here. So, this is going to be my transcript. How many lines will there be in this transcript? How many triples will there be in this transcript? Clearly, number of triples is exactly equal to the number of, of time steps, right? Because at every step, the every step the computer takes, it is going to make one entry into its diary or its transcript. And that is going to be this triple. So, the number of triples is exactly equal to the number of, number of time steps. So, if I want to estimate the time taken by this computer on this particular problem, all I need to do is to count how many triples I have, I have in my diary or in this transcript. You might now wonder what is the big deal? We wanted to estimate time, now we want to estimate triples. There is actually a rather interesting property to, to this to these triples. And this idea is that every triple in this transcript must be different. Transcript will have to be different So, what I am claiming is that if this is the transcript that my computer wrote, then Subsequently, I am not ever going to see the entry 1, 10, 2 again. So, this is never going to happen. Why is that? The answer to that comes in the changes that we made. So, if some entry reappears, then that means the computer is executing that same statement, whatever that statement is with the same two previous parameters, same two values of c and i. But then that means that k s must have been called with exactly those two values c and i again, twice at least. But that was precisely the point of the changes that we made. So, we said that before we make a call to k s, the computer actually checks did I already execute this call? If I did execute that call, I am just going to pick up that value from my table. And therefore, we know that the computer never makes a call to k s twice with the same values. So, that from that it follows that every triple in the transcript will have to be different. Now, that gives us a good way to estimate the max, the total length of the transcript. We just count how many different triples can there be. So, let us go back to the place where we wrote down whatever triples were. So, this is our definition of the triples. So, since every triple has to be different, the total number of the total length of the transcript will be at most the number of different triples that are possible. Okay. So, the number of different triples that are possible is simply the number of lines in the program times the maximum value of the capacity okay, uh, 
times the different values that I can take. The different values that I can take are n, okay, the number of objects. So, this is the number of entries that can there be in the transcript. So, let us complete our example. So, in our case, the number of lines in the program we just said was say something like 20 times the capacity we said was 10 and n was 5. Well, actually we should have said n plus 1 because we allowed uh, the program, the procedure to be called not with just the number of objects, but one beyond the number of objects as well. So, in that case it is 6. So, then we can estimate that this has to be 60 times 2 equals 1200. So, our program will require 1200 steps of execution. In general, the number of the number of lines in the program does not depend on the capacity that is given to you nor to the number of objects and therefore, I can write this as O of 1 times C times n or the total time taken is simply O of n times C, which is much much less than 2 to the n which was what we would get with backtrack search. And this is what we get with dynamic programming. So, let me let me now summarize the main ideas in all this. The main ideas in all this are 2, 3. Okay. So, the first idea is, so let me just review this. This is a review. Okay. The main ideas are first, think of, think about whether the optimization problem can be expressed as a sequence of decisions. Okay. This is something that we need in, even in order to do backtrack search. But beyond that, in dynamic programming, we do something more. What we do more in dynamic programming is that rather than think of extending solution, okay, so do not extending solution, but solving smaller problem of the same kind. That is how we, that is the important dynamic programming step, dynamic programming idea. Let me say this is the first dynamic programming idea. And then the second dynamic programming idea is check if same problem is being solved again. If so, keep a table and save time. So, we keep a table and we save time by not repeating that calculation. So, these are the three ideas in dynamic programming. Well, the first idea was really similar to, was really common to backtrack search, but these are the two new important ideas. And then there is also a fourth idea which is for the analysis. The fourth idea says that do not use recurrences, recurrence relations. to estimate time, but instead 
use this transcript idea. So these are the important ideas. So let me let me now say a little bit about what we are going to talk about in the next lecture. In the next lecture, we are going to use a slightly different formulation of what we have seen so far and that will actually end up eliminating the recursion and in, in some ways it will simplify further our view of this whole procedure and then we will also use dynamic programming on some other problems. On these other problems, the expression and our program will become a little bit more complicated, but the basic idea as you will see will remain more or less the same. Thank you.